the 11th hour regulatory impact economic bombshell. Martin North, John Adams, in the interest of people. Hello, John. Hello, sir. So we're getting to the end of the journey, but you've got a new angle. Uh, so we had the testimony on Thursday. Today is Sunday. Um, so with my testimony to the Senate Economics Committee, I uh, took a question on notice from Senator Patrick about regulation impact statements and whether one was done um, in this context about the cash ban. Um, so. Over the last couple of days, I have been preparing a response, and the response is now seven pages, and I'll be submit. So I've got until tomorrow to submit to uh, submit my response. But while I was preparing my response to the senator's question, I came across something which is technical, but actually very important and very critical that I thought it was, you know, important to highlight to the audience because uh, one of the things that shocked me about um, the, the whole day. Uh, particularly the um, the testament from Flight Centre, which was before me, was to listen. When you listen to um, a large business like a travel agency, and you understand what does this actually mean for a business of how do you change your systems, your processes, your procedures? How much does it actually cost to comply with this law? Um, not only is, is this law bad law for the purposes or for the reasons that you and I have discussed so far, that the practicalities of this law are horrendous, um, and it's going to inflict um, huge costs on the economy um, and not and, and for not a lot of benefit and that was basically what, we, what I said in my testimony and Fly Center gave some very practical information about um, why that is and the system um, that, that is supposed to ensure that we get good law has broken down and we're going to reveal how the system broke down and what are the consequences of that is. Right, so just to be clear, the regulatory impact statement is meant to be part of the uh, legislative process to ensure that we get really good outcomes. Before the law even gets to Parliament, so within the departments, they're supposed to go through a process to ensure that, um, that they're, they're putting forward the, 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 the best option to solve a public policy problem, and that option um, is going to actually generate a benefit for the economy and the community. Right, and in this case, our hypothesis is that they haven't really gone through that process appropriately, so we've, we've ended up potentially with draft law that's really bad. Exactly. Okay. Well, let's take that conversation. I guess we should probably start with some clarity around precisely what the, the regulatory impact statement, or should we say RIS, is? Yes. <laughs> Otherwise, yeah. we'll be just tripping over ourselves every time we say it. Yes, yes. So the regulation impact statements, that, I mean, the, all the, the, short, the court's shorthand as a RIS. Hmm. Now, the regulatory, regulatory impact management uh, was something that was first came in the Western world with the uh, presidency of Ronald Reagan. Um, and, and they basically said that, you know, you needed to go through a, a rigorous process to actually assess, you know, the quality of laws and regulations before you actually put them into effect. So, um, so since the, you know, since the 1980s, uh, governments around the world have adopted various uh, um, procedures and mechanisms uh, and systems um, to ensure that we have good regulatory management. Um, and so in the Australian context, uh, in the federal government, so there's a unit called the Office of Best Practice Regulation. So um, uh, when I was working on deregulation as a bureaucrat back in uh, 2008, 9, 10, uh, this unit was in the Department of Finance. Uh, now, uh, since when uh, the Abbott government uh, came in in 2013, they moved that unit to the uh, department of the prime minister and cabinet. So, so, so this office of best practice regulation, I mean, they are the gatekeeper. So they are supposed to ensure that with every cabinet submission or every non-cabinet decision that, that is of a significant nature, there's a, regula a regulation impact statement that, that, that is done. And that statement is, is done to a very high standard, very robust standard, so that, um, you know, that, that, so again, I mean, what did I say in my testimony? Kevin Rudd said you need evidence-based policy. So part of this is to show the evidence that, that this is going to be good law. It's going to provide a, a benefit to the community. And that's actually going to address the problem that the policymakers have, have found um, and that this is the best option of a range of options. Okay. Right. So it's meant to be a standalone gatekeeper process. Yeah before a bill comes into the parliamentary process? Correct. Okay. So before it goes to cabinet, a risk is supposed to have been prepared. Mm. Now, there's a handbook, 
about, about regulatory management. And this handbook uh, was uh, signed off by uh, Josh Frydenberg when he was the Parliament's Secretary to the Prime Minister back in 2014. Now, that handbook has a series of principles um, that that uh, all policymakers in, Australia, in, the, in the federal government should adhere to. And for the purposes of, of the cash ban, there are four key principles that we should uh, uh, have a talk about. So, so let's put these four principles on, on the screen, and I'm just going to quickly read them to you. So uh, principle one, a regulation should not be a default option for policymakers. The policy option offering the greatest net benefit should always be the recommended option. Uh, principle two, regulation should be imposed only when it can be shown to offer an overall net benefit. Uh, uh, principle three, the cost burden of new regulation must be fully offset by re reductions in existing regulatory burden. And principle four, every substantive regulatory policy change must be subject of a regulation impact statement. So, so this is why this was a, a key issue that I raised. And, and, and so after my testimony, this issue came up um, um, during the afternoon about was a regulation impact statement done or not, because uh, principle four says you must do one. And principle two says if you are going to do one, you must clearly show a net benefit. This idea of the net benefit or the best benefit, right? That seems to be a very critical linchpin of this whole process. Once you've done your regulation pick statement, you're supposed to show that you have generated a, a net benefit. Now, in some cases, you can't generate a net benefit. Sometimes, um, you know, you know, uh, you may look at, at two or three or four options, and all of those options impose a net cost. But you but in that instance, you're going to choose the option that generates the the least cost, um, and you you can justify to say that of all the possible options, you know, from the, all the rigorous analysis that that have been done, um, we have picked the the you know um, you know we, we've picked the best option, um, you know, and that that's based on the on the analysis that we've done. Now the the key question then becomes is, well, um, if you have to pick the, the, the best option that generates the best benefit or the least cost, how do you do that? And how do you do that? You generally have a cost benefit analysis. And so, um, uh, so when you have a regulation pack statement, um, you should be you know, having a bit of a detailed um, quantitative uh, analysis about what are the benefits likely to be, put some sort of quantitative number on that. Um, sometimes that's hard to do because of a range of reasons, but also you want to um, come up with an estimate of, of what the regulatory cost is. And regulatory cost includes effectively two things. It's, it's the direct financial cost of complying with a particular law or regulation, but it's also the opportunity cost. So um, if you have to spend a lot of time complying with a law, but you don't actually have to uh, spend a lot of direct money complying with that law, well, that time is actually a, a regulatory cost. And, and, and so that, that's sort of captured in, in terms of these calculations, in terms of what the net benefit is, or what the benefit is and what the, and what the cost is. And so when it comes to the cash ban, um, what we should have seen is, is a, 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 a detailed analysis of, well, what will the benefits be of introducing this law and what are the costs associated with it? Um, and there should have been some sort of demonstration that this was going to generate a net benefit to the community and to the economy. Right, and so just to be clear, the costs aren't just the technical costs of implementation at the parliamentary level, but it's actually the execution, you know, for example, flight centre, right? What they would have to spend to be able to make their systems and processes compliant with the new system. Y yes, yes. So, so the flight centre costs, and we'll get into the flight centre in a second, um, it would be uh, how much money they would directly have to spend to change their systems processes, um, uh, how to train staff, how to do compliance to ensure that they're compliant with the law. But also if they have to spend, you know, um, non-financial costs like a lot of time to, to get staff into a position that they're comfortable to um, uh, to operate under the law, that cost is also incorporated in, in, in terms of the calculation. If I think of the cost benefits, the other question is, this is a law about tax leakage and essentially trying to um, you know secure more tax income into Treasury, right? Yes. So should they have then thought about the other things they should have done, for example, you know, tax leakage at the top end of town, should that be part of the process too? What I would argue is that, is that and, and you know, it was part of my testimony, and, and Senator Patrick to sort of raise this uh, quite aggressively in the afternoon mm. is, um, if tax leakage, um, um, you know, if that is a huge problem, uh, well, where, you know, where are the obvious problems around losing tax revenue, um, and, and what are the possible options going forward? Uh, and the point I made, and the point that Senator Patrick has made, is that there's at least one third of large corporations in Australia, including foreign multinationals, that pay that have paid no tax over the last five years. So, so, so now that's been done all legally. So there's no illegal activity in that, but there's a number of loopholes that potentially could be tightened to ensure 
ensure that. Um, and again, now philosophically, I'm a believer that we, we should have low taxes in Australia, but I'm, I'm not a believer that the people should be paying exorbitant middle class taxes and large and the big end of town, the big end of town pay no tax. I mean, I think that I think that's unfair. So 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 there has to be some recognition that if, if some of these large multinational companies. Uh, who are making tens of billions of dollars pay no tax? I mean, there there is something uh, potentially wrong with the tax system. And so, if you if you fix that part of the system, what well, you're going to generate more tax revenue there, and you don't necessarily have to, um, you, know, you know, try to push these the the these sort of um, these tyrannical laws on people like us, trying to squeeze every sort of last dollar out of the middle class. So, John, before we get into more detailed discussion about this, let's just try and understand what those key questions are that the IRS is going after. So when a bureaucrat, um, uh, when they complete a regulation impact statement, the statement is supposed to answer seven questions. Now, uh, you know, one, what is the problem you are trying to solve? Two, why is government action needed? Three, what policy options are you considering? Four, what is the likely net benefit of each option? Five, who will you consult about these options and how will you consult them? Uh, six, what is the best option from those you have considered? Uh, seven, how will you implement and evaluate your chosen option? So, so when you see a regulation impact statement, you're supposed to see answers to these seven questions. And part of the job of the Office of Best Practice Regulation is to ensure that these seven questions have been answered. And so um, for the purposes of, of today's conversation, question four is actually very critical because the principle says, you know, um, the new new law, new regulation has to generate a net benefit. And so part of what you have to answer in the regulation impact statement is, well, what is the likely net benefit? So you're supposed to you know, try to give some sort of quantum around that. Um, and, and that's why it's so critical. Right. So basically what we're saying is there were issues with regard to alternative strategies that could have generated more uh, tax creation. Yes. Right? And then on the implementation side, there wasn't enough, not enough detail on what it would really cost if the cash ban were to be executed and implemented. Yeah. And that's where we're going to think we're going to look at Flight Centre in more detail. Yes, yes. So um, and Flight Centre testified before me on Thursday um, and, and, and they gave some very practical examples of what this law means for their business. Now, now they have about 7,000 employees. They have uh, offices uh, or branches right across the country. Um, so uh, what I want to do is I want to play two clips from Flight Centre. One is their opening statement, uh, which goes for a couple of minutes. And then there was an interaction between Senator Patrick and the witness from Flight Flight Centre, uh, because that talks specifically about well, what, what are the costs involved in complying with the law. So let's play those clips. And we should say these are audio clips only, because there was only an audio recording of the session. Yeah, I think I think my opening remarks are really just referring to to our submission, um, and that is that that Flight Centre is supportive of uh, additional regulations uh, for cash transactions above ten thousand dollars. However, we have uh, numerous concerns around our ability to implement. Uh, those in, in, in strict time frames uh, and also I suppose our on, ongoing ability to comply considering the penalties etc involved so from a from a travel agency point of view our transactions are quite complex uh, they can be done over a period of time um, you know so there's going to be a lot of questions uh, from our consultants as to how we're going to manage this um, you know where does the limit apply is it to a whole booking is it to one individual transaction etc so there's some complexity around that that we really need to understand um, our ability to enhance our systems to be able to manage that and give us the reporting we need uh, is quite complex, um, as will be the training. Uh, we do have over 7,000 staff around Australia. They're all going to need to be trained. Um, we've gone out with some initial messaging and the volume of questions we got back was quite overwhelming. Uh, so we need to be able to manage that and make sure they're, they're well informed. So that's, that's one of our key concerns. And I think leading, leading from there is, is the public awareness. We are concerned that uh, it's effectively going to be up to, to us uh, as the gatekeepers to be informing the public. Um, it's, you know, if you put yourself in a position of a consultant sitting in a store, someone comes in to buy their holiday, which they've been saving up most of their life to do, and then the consultant tells them they can't transact in cash more than $10,000 and the customer has no awareness of that, uh, that's quite a challenging conversation for that consultant. It puts them in a very difficult position to be able to manage that. Uh, when they're actually there to try and fulfil someone's dream to go on a holiday. So we really, we really want to, um, I suppose, encourage the government to, to think about that public uh, awareness campaign. The penalties and breaches we think are quite severe. Uh, and I think, you know, it's certainly, certainly for a company, 
uh, where you do have a large volume of, of employees. You can have all the best systems and processes in, in the world in place. Uh, however, there will be, or potentially there will be risk of breaches. Um, and yet there doesn't seem to be um, any, any sort of defence from a corporate where you are taking all reasonable steps to ensure you can meet compliance. Uh, and I think the enforcement component was, was quite uh, unclear to us exactly how this is going to be enforced. So we obviously have a, a financial services arm uh, with our travel money business. We're quite used to AML obligations. It's very clear how we need to transact or how we need to act in that space. It, it's very unclear how this would work. Um, and having multiple or, or not clear uh, regulators, not clear guidelines on how we report breaches or what our obligations are is, is again a challenge for us. So. They're, they're really the key points that Flight Centre. Okay, in your in your submission, you talked about the need uh, to slow down the implementation of this bill to allow the company to put in place measures that uh, will uh, ensure that it complies with the legislation. Uh, what measures uh, w would those be? Would they be procedural measures? Would they be software changes? Uh, what do you see as uh, having to happen within your company in order to comply with this legislation? Yeah, both both of those things. So we're already we're obviously already considering what's required and starting to look at what we need to do uh, in anticipation. Um, so definitely systems changes, and we have multiple systems involved in a in a leisure transaction at the front end. So we have to consider all of those and how that process works and what we need to adjust in each 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 element of that. Uh, and then also um, the the training. And the procedures, um, the consultants in, in the sales process, I suppose, in the, in the receding process particularly. So, while well, you've got systems changes that we need to be able to track and flag and try and put limits on on cash receipts for, and then of course you've got to define what is a transaction, etc. Um, the the rest of it is then just instructing uh, and training our our consultants into what to do. Also, frequently asked questions as to how to respond to customers, etc. So, yeah, it's a combination of systems, processes, policy. And training. Okay, and, uh, and presumably compliance sitting on top of that. Absolutely, the compliance regime. Sorry, I should have yeah, sought. So there's a whole, then there's a whole compliance regime or monitoring regime that has to sit over the top of that. Um, so from a, a risk or an internal order perspective. Okay, now in, in terms of going to your software providers, you said there were multiple systems. Uh, most uh, computer programs are pretty uh, unforgiving uh, in terms of wishy washy rules. So, uh, yeah, would you say that it's impossible to properly implement uh, software that would achieve the government's objective without greater clarity uh, as to uh, some of those uh, items you mentioned before? Impossible is a big word, um, and I'm not a software developer, so I probably can't really talk to that. Um, a lot of our software that we use in our leisure environment is in-house and, 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 built, and built in. Uh, so we need to get our developers to try and work on that, and I know that they've been scratching their heads trying to work out how uh, we might we might implement this and what sort of controls we can put in place. Um, because one of the one of the things that we're particularly concerned about is not making the sales process complex for either the consultant or, but more importantly, the customer. Because the more difficult it is for a customer to transact, the less likely it is that they will transact. Um, so we have to, you know, it's a really big focus to make sure the customer experience is good. So. So the system has to has to account for that. So impossible, I, I'm, I'm, yeah, I can't comment on impossible. I think it'll be a challenge. It's certainly more of a challenge if it's not very, very clear and we don't have clear definitions of um, how this is going to apply to our, our business. Okay, well that's pretty clear, John, isn't it? Here I am sitting um, um, in the gallery, you know, preparing myself mentally to testify and I'm listening to this and, and, and like my, my mind's going in, in, in a whole bunch of different places thinking, wow, I mean, I, I, you know, because we're thinking about this from a from a holistic policy point, point of view and, and we're, we're now getting a, someone in business saying at a very practical level um, how hard um, is it going to be to actually comply with this law. And so Flight Centre, you know, I mean, that is only one business and ha think of, a, of how many businesses um, that, that would be of their size that would have to go through this whole process to, to actually comply, who, who actually deal with, with, with cash in one form or another. Um, you, know, um, you know, for these businesses, this law is actually very bad law. And, and you know, one of the big concerns that they have is, is that, that you know, uh, because remember, the government wanted this to, to, 
to to pass last year and to start on 1 January. And there's a whole bunch of people in business saying, we, you know, if you're going to make this the law, we have to go through so many things to to get ourselves ready to comply. Um, you know, because uh, I've heard, I think, from, from, from some quarters that they want the start date to, to, to start maybe in 2021. So to push it out at least 12 months, you know, give us some time to actually get ready to, to actually comply with this. Now, um, I think that given that the real reason, and this is what I said in my testimony, this is about negative interest rates. They want this to start as soon as possible because negative interest rates may come in sooner than 2021. Yeah, absolutely. But nevertheless, you know, Flight Centre is very clear. There are significant systems costs, training costs, and a bunch of other things. And as you say, that's not the only business that's going to have this same issue. So the total costs across the whole of the economy to put this in would be massive. Yes. The, the, and I was going to say, the, one of the other like, things that really jumped out at me was that, so in my testimony, um, w one of the points I made was that millions of Australians have no idea that, that this law is coming in. Mm. Um, and, and when the flight centre management team told their employees that 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 this law is being proposed um, and it may result in, in you know you go to jail, um, a lot of employees uh, you know asked a lot of questions, expressed a lot of concerns, and they were fearful. You know they just want to go to work, earn an income, and live their life. They don't want to think oh, if I go to if I if I go to work I, you know, and I make a mistake, I may actually go to jail. So so you know the part of the testimony from flight centre was that this this law is actually scary people and and the political ramifications that is when millions of people have no idea that this is potentially being voted on in a couple of weeks time um, and the point I made is if, if this passes the political ramifications for Parliament will be huge because people are going to say well hey no one told me about this because you know, people watch us but people still heavily rely on the mainstream media to get their news and information and for a whole host of reasons um, the mainstream media haven't reported this in detail um, and particularly the financial review, they, they keep on calling us conspiracy theorists. <laughs> well, Aaron Patrick was at it again. Yes, yes. Well, yeah, he was at it again. He was actually in the uh, committee room uh, when, uh, and I got to speak to him after I testified. And I went up to him and said, mate, are you going to write, write a real story this time or are you here to write more propaganda? Um, <laughs> and guess what? It was more propaganda. Well, yeah, he, he, it was more propaganda. So, uh, so, so yeah, so, so, you know, I mean, people need to understand with, with AFR that, 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 you know, it's not a legitimate news source, it's actually a PR agency for the banking system. Sure. Now, interestingly, in the afternoon, uh, they did then come back to this question of the RIS, wasn't it? Yes. Uh, and, and interestingly, I thought Treasury was really on the back foot on this. Yes, yes. So, so we had the flight centre discussion, and then the night came up, and I basically said there was no regulation impact statement, and that um, this was going to impose huge uh, costs on the economy and on certain businesses. And, and so um, we, we had... Um, you know, we had Senator Patrick, we had Senator McAllister, Senator Kitching taking up this line of attack with Treasury. So Treasury was up in the afternoon um, and there was a lot of back and forth about regulation impact statements and the quality of it and, 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 and what was going on. So we actually have, um, so, so, so this happened um, in, in various parts over, over a span of 20 or 30 minutes, but we actually have summarised um, some of the key interactions and we're going to actually play that because it's actually quite critical to actually understand why this is so important. It was raised uh, with evidence provided by, this morning by Flight Centre uh, that they will have to go through this uh, a process of modifying software, um, uh, modifying processes, training personnel and indeed in, uh, um, looking at uh, their own compliance measures to, in order to comply with the law. Um, there is no regulatory impact statement in relation to this legislation. It would appear there are costs associated with it. Why is there no RIS? So the regulatory impact statement is the report itself. So the report went through a robust and thorough consideration of the measure before they made a recommendation. The report also makes puts puts black down economy. options. Yeah, the black economy report. So does it does it spell out what the cost of implementation It of says there will be costs. But it doesn't um, tell you what it doesn't spell are. those out. Um, to that extent, Mr Bonaparte uh, uh, it's not a regulatory impact statement. Uh, well, the regulatory really, impact statement. It's a prescribed form and it's a kind of analysis that, you know, is, is, is a very particular form of analysis and we can have a debate about whether it's always appropriate. But in this case, you can't argue it was undertaken in the report. It really wasn't. And can you 
point me to the specific pages in the Black Economy Task Force report that deals with the detailed cost benefit analysis so that's required under a normal RIS. It's in Chapter 3. Chapter 3. Okay. Um, Mr Bonham, I'm in Chapter 3 of the final report of the Black Economy Task Force. So it's Chapter 3 entitled Moving to a Near Non-Cash World. It goes through how we transact is evolving. Um, there's a graph comparing us with other countries. Why using, why the end of, why the move away from cash is a good thing. Blah blah blah. Um, supply chain effects. So, where in chapter three is is the detailed cost benefit analysis, which is one of the headings so you normally get in a RIS? It's on page fifty four. Fifty four. Um, and I and it gets back to my earlier question. Oh, sorry, in response to one of your early questions, which is that we don't necessarily have a benchmark on which to do a cost-benefit analysis but because this, it's all hidden. This is four paragraphs and the last one is one sentence. That doesn't seem to me a very detailed... I mean, when you look at a RIS, usually it's more detailed than that. I mean, this is... I can see it all on the whole yeah. bit on my screen. So, the, as I said, it gets back to that what is our baseline and we are, taught, we are looking at, um, by its nature, uh, part of the economy which is not very, uh, well, you don't have much data on how much is working because it is deliberately hidden. It's, no, it's, it's okay. deliberately hidden from enforcement agencies and it's deliberately hidden from, um, um, from other, other agencies as well. Um, so, so you're saying it's not possible to do a detailed cost The benchmark is very difficult to do and so that's what they found it. in Europe. So what was interesting to me, John, was Treasury has an obligation, and I don't think they actually have discharged their obligation. Yes, so, 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 so a couple of things come from this interaction. One is, is that the, the Treasury says that the Black Economy Task Force report, um, that in and of itself is the regulation impact statement. Hmm. Um, so uh, now, uh, th they said that the specific analysis on the cost and benefits of the cash spend is page 54 um, and, and what we heard Senator Kitching um, go back for uh, you know go back at Treasury at, to say is that this page 54 is only four paragraphs and one of these paragraphs is only one sentence um, and, and, and generally in a regulation impact statement you're looking at much more detailed analysis of a on, on a cost benefit uh, sort of basis um, and that clearly that clearly wasn't done so um, and obviously Senator, Senator McAllister say you know she, she found it sort of she was some, somewhat down, dumbfounded to say, how can you argue that this report is, is the equivalent of a regulation impact statement? So the senators had a challenge with this. Now, this is going to be a point that that I had a conversation with Senator Kitching after the uh, after the hearing finished, and she said this was going to be a point that the that the inquiry makes in its report about the, the lack of a detailed cost benefit analysis. Now, um, uh, as part of my formal response, uh, we're going to get into you know some of these key issues that are going to amplify in terms of this issue. But 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 you know if a proper regulation impact statement process had been followed, um, and, and and clearly if they could not show a net benefit that was going to be generated from this, um, or they, they didn't pick the best options possible. And part of my testimony was that if you're going for money laundering, um, you know, go after real estate transactions, um, uh, and there's a completely different way to go about doing that. If you want to do um, a tax leakage, uh, you know, go after large corporates, you don't have to go through this thing. So they didn't pick the best option. Um, and, and, with, and with this, with the option that they picked, this cash ban, um, you know, you know. I think flight center demonstrates that, that that you know it's very hard to think of how this is going to um, generate a net benefit, particularly because of Professor Snyder, who I quoted, who basically said there's weak empirical evidence that this stuff is actually going to work. Yeah, and of course, one of the things that came up in the hearing again was that multiple agencies across government would all have some interaction and some involvement in this, but it didn't seem to me that there was going to be a lead implementation area. Correct. Which to me is just dumb. Um, yes, Martin, I would fully agree with that. Now, so, so, so the key question of this whole episode is, is that um, how did this law um, sort of get to where it did? What we're about to go through now is what I think um, is, is, is this 11th hour bombshell about, um, you know, it's supposed to go through a process. There's a gatekeeper, the Office of Best Practice Regulation, that's supposed to stop bad proposals going forward. And yet this still got through the system, got to Cabinet, is, is got to through the House of Reps, is in front of the Senate, 
about to be, you know, an inquiry is about to be finished and, and potentially could become law when, when if you look at the, the principles of good regulation, you know, this law should never have been um, proposed in the first place. Right, so what you're saying, John, is there is effectively something broken within the governmentary process around this which has allowed this to come through. Yeah. And so standing back from the specifics around the cash ban, this begs some more important questions about the way that government works. Yes, yes. So, so, so now, uh, what, what we can reveal in this conversation is, is that March of last year, um, so, so, so under this regulation impact statement uh, process, um, the, the, you know, a senior executive of, of each of the departments is supposed to certify that they have complied with the requirements of the regulation impact statement process. And then that certification goes to the Office of Best Practice Regulation, and then, and then they basically will say, yes, um, I, mean, it, I mean, they'll basically check the analysis, they'll check the RIS, uh, and they'll agree with that certification. Not, And if they don't, they'll go back to the department and say, we'll try again, or you need to do better, or we need, we need to put more detail on the, on, on, in terms of two or three areas. So, so what we can reveal is, is that on the, um, on the 5th of March 2019, a, a Deputy Secretary from Treasury wrote to the Office of Best Practice Regulation and basically said that the Black Economy Task Force report is the equivalent of a RIS because the, the report answered all seven questions that we covered earlier um, in terms of, in terms of the, the conversation that we had right, right now. Um, so um, I'm going to put this quote on the screen. So, so this comes from the letter, uh, and we can also put the letter on the screen as well. So the quote is um, you know, fr from, from this Deputy Secretary, um, quote, Accordingly, I am satisfied that the attached report meets best practice consistent with the Australian Government Guide to Regulation. Um, so, 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 yes, yeah, so, so, yeah, so she's saying that the Black Economy Task Force report, you know, meets, um, you know, the, the best practice standards that the government uh, bureaucrats are supposed to adhere to. Um, uh, now, um, so, so that letter went from Treasury to the Office of Best Practice Regulation in March. Now, in December, so this is January, well, we're the first, 2nd of February today. So in December, so only about a month and a half ago, the Office of Best Practice Regulation published on their website their assessment of this Treasury letter. So, so I think they had to wait for the parliamentary process to get to a certain point before they published. And so the Office of Best Practice Regulation, um, you know, that, that what they put on their website um, is, is the following quote. Quote, the Treasury was compliant with the Australian Government RIS requirements but the Treasury was not consistent with the best practice at the transparency stage. This is because a copy or a hyperlink to the task force report was not included in the explanatory memorandum of the bill. Now, the question then, so, 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 so the question here is, Treasury says we're compliant and we have self-certified we are compliant. The office, the gatekeeper says we accept that your certification, that you are compliant. Now, uh, you know, when we look at this, independently, we don't think that this meets the requirements because the requirement says that regulations and new laws have to have a net benefit and Treasury by its own admission says we can't calculate what a net benefit is. So how, how did we get to the stage that the Office of Best Practice Regulation said that Treasury was compliant? Now here, here is where the bombshell is. So, um, so also on the OBPR website, um, it, you know, we, we see the following quote. The Department of, of the Treasury certified that the Black Economy Task Force final report met the requirements of a regulation impact uh, statement. The Office of Best Practice Regulation does not assess the quality of independent re reviews or RIS-like processes used in lieu of a RIS. Um, that is an absolute bombshell. So basically, the gatekeeper is saying that when a when the government, uh, uh, you know, when they initiate a review. Um, and that review is, is deemed to be the equivalent of a regulation impact statement. It doesn't matter what it says in the review, we can't check the quality of it. And that's why this law, which clearly does not generate a net benefit, how did this get through the system? The Office of Best Practice Regulation by its own practices, we don't check the quality. And, and you heard in the, in, in the back and forth between Senator Kitching and Treasury, um, you know, they, they're basically, the, the Senator is saying that we expect more detail, more analysis. Um, and, and, and this is where the system has completely broken down. So what we're saying is they've just basically set a low bar and then just jumped over it 
but without any analysis or critique of anything along the way. Yes, yes. So, so, so yeah, so basically the Black Economy Task Force Fund report came up with four paragraphs, um, no detailed analysis, no cost-benefit analysis. Um, you know, so, so they say we think it's going to be a net benefit. Um, a whole bunch of other independent people are saying, no, we think this is going to be a huge net cost. Um, uh, and we hear testimony from Flight Center, but also if you go back to the December hearings from, from the Small Business Ombudsman, but also from the Australian Taxpayers Alliance, they're saying this is going to be quite horrific for, uh, for certain sectors in, in, in the business community. Um, and, 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 and this only got through because... Um, the gatekeeper says, in, in this instance, we don't check, the, we're not actually going to check what you actually wrote. Um, and they just basically just, it, it's a tick and flick. Mm. Tick and flick, no look. Um, and so um, if we actually had a proper regulation impact framework that was working well in, uh, within the federal government, um, they would have said that, no, um, you know, separate to the Black Economy Task Force final report, you actually need to do more detailed analysis to actually show that there's a net benefit. And if you can't, you know, government should actually reject. So government doesn't actually have to, so this was a recommendation, This the $10,000 cash man. The government doesn't have to accept that recommendation. So so there were certain recommendations in the report that the government actually rejected. They reject, They accepted about 90 to 95%. There was a, a few of them that they said, we, we, you know, we're not going to accept. So there's no inherent requirement for government to accept this recommendation. And so if we had a proper process, um, you know, the Office of Best Practice Regulation should have advised Cabinet to say that the report in and of itself, uh, you know, it doesn't actually demonstrate that this cash ban is going to generate a net benefit. Therefore, unless if further analysis can be done to prove a net benefit, the, the Cabinet should, should reject this law. That's how the proper system should have worked. And the system completely broke down because the Office of Best Practice Regulation said, we're not going to check the quality um, and whatever the Task Force Fund report uh, uh, wrote, we would just accept on face value. Mm. And isn't it remarkable that the self-certification from Treasury, which is basically just a very short letter, right? Yes. Is then just ticked off by the review and nobody looked at the real detail. Uh, yeah, exactly. It's astonishing. Yes, yes. So, 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 so yeah, so, and, and to be honest, I'm a little bit sort of, uh, you know, we, we've covered a lot of material over the last six months and, and it's like, you know, perhaps, perhaps I should have looked at this, although um, the final detail didn't come out um, uh, like until the 19th of December. So, so, so we were sort of focused on a couple of other things. But, but now that we, we, we have seen this, um, so I've prepared a seven page response to Senator Patrick's uh, question that I took on notice. And uh, when I submit later today my, my, my formal response, I'll be making sure that the, the senators on the committee, but other people within the within the government, within the parliament, know that um, that this law shouldn't should never have seen the light of day, and it only saw the light of day because the gatekeeper basically turned a blind eye. Right, and we know that the cash ban is going to impose huge costs on businesses across the country. That was clear, clearly the evidence. We know that they haven't actually followed the original RIS seven points that you spoke about earlier on. Yeah. And so essentially what we've got is a piece of legislation that is muddy, mucky and stupid. And the processes within government have basically allowed it through. Precisely. Precisely. So yeah, so, so what I would do in, term, look at, in terms of summarising the conversation, I'd, I'd make four points. Point one, the cash ban is going to impose a net cost on the economy and damage economic outcomes in Australia. Uh, point two, the cash ban has failed the core principles of good regulatory management and should not become law. Again, uh, point three, uh, the, the gatekeeper within government has failed to do its job by stopping a bad law uh, getting through the system. Uh, and point four, you know, Senators McAllister and, and Kitching, as well as Senator Patrick, uh, will find this uh, materially significant and no doubt include this point in, their, in the inquiry report. One of the concerns of our audience, and so before the hearing actually started, I had a, a, a private conversation with Senator, uh, uh, Senator Brockman, who's the committee chair, and I said to him, there's a perception out there that this entire, this entire inquiry, I mean, the whole thing is rigged. You guys have already cut a, you know, you've already cut a deal with, with the ALP, uh, and you're just going through the motion. So he said, we're aware of that perception. And I said, well, that perception, you know, it, it actually undermines the integrity of the committee and the inquiry. So he said, we're aware of that. So, so there is a perception and I got some messages in this morning 
of some people who, who think that that even though we've done a, you know we've put up a, a gallant fight to, to stop this uh, it's still going to become law so it could still will, will be but um, you know um, so but there's still potentially a, a chance to on this particularly technical point for the committee to say hey there's a whole bunch of uh, bad things about this law uh, but also the the system um, that is to ensure good law broke down, um, and this this law should never have gone through the cabinet, should never have gone through to parliament, um, and therefore the fact that it cannot demonstrate a net benefit, it should be rejected on that and that alone. Yeah, and that actually gives them a way out, doesn't it? But yes, absolutely, absolutely. So, so yeah, so so we we're, we're giving this to to the ALP on and the Greens on a silver platter. Let's see if they actually take you know whether they take it up or not. Right. And, uh, you know, there's a few days left. There isn't really much more that we can do now. I think we've probably gone through the whole journey and <laughs> explored this from every dimension and every side. We still think it's a bad bill. Yeah. Um, is there anything that our viewers can do between now and the 7th? What, what, what I would say is that, so today's the 2nd. Um, the, the inquiry port, um, it's, it's due on the 7th. Um, so if there's any potential uh, technical material that you think um, you know that that it is important that the inquiry should be aware of now the formal submission process um, you know that has all ended but you know look technically nothing stops you from emailing the uh, member the senators on the inquiry committee to say hey have you thought about this have you thought about that and maybe some of that last minute detail like my uh, question or my answer to the question of notice maybe that sort of changes things um, um, you know like a, a particular of the next 48 to 72 hours but 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 separate to that you know this bill when it comes to a vote so uh, when the when the choir report is due on friday next week we don't know exactly what happens after that the government may bring it to a vote um and and i got a bit of a suspicion that they may or or they may say we may we need to rewrite the bill we need to rewrite the the rules or we we may you know uh, scrap it we, we we don't exactly know how it's going to going to play out but um but if it does come up for a vote it's down to Labor. It's down to the Greens, um, and, and so if, you know uh, what I would say to the viewers is is that uh, contacting Labor senators, contacting um, the, the the senators from the Greens, and making your views clearly known. Um, you know, uh, you know, people can use some of the episodes that we've used. People can share my testimony. Uh, I'm, you know, uh, you know, so. A lot of people thought that I did quite well. Um, you know, I tried to do the best that I can. So if people think that I, you know, did well and put up uh, some convincing arguments um, to the committee, people can take our view, uh, show and, and send a send a link to a whole host of senators so that they are aware all their staff about you know you should listen to this, etc. So um, yeah, I mean th th that that's the only thing we can do from from here on in is to really apply pressure on the Greens and Labor and say, um, if you vote this down, this will not become law. Um, and, and, you know, you know, one of the points, like one of the final points I'll make is, is that, and, and, and some people in Labor trying to use this, um, you know, trying to uh, escape responsibility, uh, you know, that they, they have told people on the phone in certain circumstances that, you know, that this is not our law, you know, that this is a law of the government. Now, um, so, 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 yeah, so, if, if Labor is thinking that by saying this that they can vote for it um, and it's not their responsibility because they didn't propose it, the, the government proposed it, I mean, I think that's just completely BS. So I think that if you are contacting uh, Labor, um, you should say to Labor, we know this is not your law, this has come from the government, but if you vote for it, you are as equally responsible for the law um, you know, in terms of, you know, in, you know, equally as responsible, whether it's, it's you, know, you know, the coalition or any other senator who, who votes for this in, in, in the Senate. So, so I think that's an important point to make. But, but other than that, you know, it, it's been sort of six months trying to fight this battle and, and we'll see if freedom at the end of the day, at the end of the day can prevail. And it's worth saying, John, I think that with the coronavirus and with the economic status looking more dodgy now here and globally, there is a greater risk of negative interest rates than perhaps even a week or two ago. And mm -hmm. therefore, there will be certain people within the government and within the Reserve Bank who want this bill and need this bill in because without it, they can't take rates negative. That's why Mr. Patrick from the AFR wrote a propaganda piece on Thursday afternoon because the establishment needs this desperately. Uh, they need it very quickly because of the reasons you suggested. Um, and, and, you know, and, and so hopefully our viewers and the broader community who are aware of this can actually you know, galvanise uh, you know, their efforts to uh, convince Labour and the Greens to vote against. Yep. Time is short, but it's not over yet. Thanks, yes. John. Thank well you. Done. Thank you.
Martin North, John Adams and Interest People. We'll see you next time.